well, this is, as I say, the, the US pushed for it mainly because of the antitrust legislation in the United States. It's not about international law, it's about their domestic regulation. And they said, so we want to be in the treaty, but be able to opt out. And we said, well, that's very messy. Why don't we leave you outside and you can opt in if you want to? They said, oh, no, that won't work in terms of our antitrust legislation. And furthermore, they said, if you don't agree to this, then we're going to fold our arms and go away and we're not going to play with you anymore. Um, all words to that effect. So we gave in, basically. Okay, what problems does it cause? Why, why don't we allow them just to do this? Well, the argument is that for the shipper, there is a risk that they will be persuaded to enter into freely negotiated volume contracts by powerful carriers. How do you decide when a shipper is sophisticated enough or large enough to enter into a volume contract? And the answer is you, you can't, and most judges won't be able to. Because with their arm behind their back, they'll come before the judge and say, yes, Your Honor, I did freely enter into this volume contract. So the concern there, I think, is largely that shippers are going to be abused and manipulated. Now, the commentators vary on how much that's likely to happen, but it does mean that the carriers now have a loophole. As far as the carriers are concerned, if they are dealing with large parties, it means that potentially they have no protection. So if Walmart says the only basis on which I will let you ship my goods is in a volume contract, and you are 100% liable for any loss you cause, the carrier has to take it or leave it. They don't have the protection of the any mandatory carriage regime. So in a way, volume contracts go right back to before 1924 again. It's complete laissez-faire freedom of contract. Um, whoever's the most powerful party can exclude their liability or impose absolute liability on the other party. For third parties, it is an absolute nightmare. You'll remember I said to you, stevedores, port companies, anyone who handles goods within the ports is a performing party. How are they going to know whether they're handling goods under a volume contract or under a Rotterdam rules contract? Because if the contract of carriage isn't covered by the Rotterdam rules, it means they're not covered by the Rotterdam rules. And there's no way you can tell from the cargo whether it's covered by a volume contract or not. Your average stevedore port company is not going to see that documentation. So I think that that's a major implication. The other thing that it's going to be difficult for is lawyers and judges. The definitions here are too vague. It may not be so bad for lawyers. You're going to make a lot of money out of this. But for parties who want to seek certainty, there's going to be a lot of litigation. Okay, the other thing that I think is really disappointing about the Rotterdam rules, you'll remember in the beginning I said that Rotterdam tries to get towards a fully, pardon me, multimodal convention. It tries to cover door-to-door -door carriage. And it does that by covering both the carrier, and you'll remember the carrier is covered right here from receipt to delivery. And it covers maritime performing parties. Those are parties that perform inside the port limits. They are all covered uniformly by the Rotterdam rules. But, especially the US railway companies and NVOCCs, non-vessel owning um, carriers, again lobbied and said, we are very happy with the current statute that deals with us, called the Cormac statute in the US. We don't want these higher rates of liability under Rotterdam, and we, the US won't sign if this is what happens. The European Union also said we're not happy with this because we already have conventions that cover road and rail. We don't want the Rotterdam rules to apply to that either. So in a, in a weak compromise, those performing parties inland are not covered by the rules, and that is a major, major gap. And as I say, I think it causes problems for the idea of joint and several liability. And I also think it gives rise to so-called convention shopping. Let's have a look at that. Okay. Now, remember we said the carrier is liable 
for all performing parties. So its liability for its own actions and for performing parties right the way across. Okay? The maritime performing parties over here, who actually do the carriage of goods, they're also liable under the Rotterdam rules. And as far as these two blue wedges goes, there's no problem. The shipper or consignee can sue either the maritime performing party or the carrier that entered into the contract with carriage of goods. Uh, um, because they're both going to be covered under the Rotterdam rules and you'll get the same amount of liability for both. So that means that the carrier can recover from them to the same limit. So if the stevedore over here drops it and the carrier gets sued, he's simply going to recover from the stevedore to the same amount. The problem is that there are two possibilities. One is the inland carrier may have lower liability. So for example, in New Zealand, domestic carriage of goods, and that's defined as when they go across the ship's tackle, is covered by a domestic statute, which only um, provides for $1,500, a very low limit. Um, so basically that means that port companies in New Zealand uh, are going to now be covered by the Rotterdam rules, but a truck company carrying the goods from Auckland to Wellington is going to be covered by a lower limit of liability. The other possibility is also true. Um, there may be higher limits of liability, and this is usually the international conventions that already apply to road and rail. The rail convention is called COTIF, and the road convention is called CNR. So if Inland carriers in Europe carry the goods across more than one country. They are already liable under these conventions. The limit there is higher. And parties aren't particularly um, happy about having to lower it under the Rotterdam rules. So if you were the shipper or the consignee and your goods were damaged, you'd sue the inland carrier under Kosher for the CMR because you'd recover more. They would then try and get it back from the carrier but they would only be able to recover the lower amount because the carrier is only liable to this lower amount under the Rotterdam rules. So the problem is it works for maritime performing parties because they have the same liability, but it doesn't work for inland carriers. Because they've been exempted from the rules, they're going to be dealt with under different systems. So this causes a, a gap and, and tension between the different systems. And this was largely the problem because the drafters of the Rotterdam rules felt that they couldn't have a fully multimodal convention because there were already these rules in play and also because particularly the US railroad company said we like our lower liability. Okay, last two things about the ugly. The first one is jurisdiction. You, by which I mean choice of jurisdiction. Are the parties allowed to choose which jurisdiction they're going to end up suing in? The Hague-Visby rules don't deal with this question at all. They simply leave it up to the parties' contract. And you may be aware courts will generally uphold um, exclusive choice of jurisdiction clauses. The other party will have to show good reason why not. Hamburg takes the opposite view. It says this would disadvantage the shipper, and therefore under Article 21, choice of court agreements are not permitted at all. Uh, the shipper basically has the choice to sue, and it's given a list of, of relevant jurisdictions that it can pick from. Now, Rotterdam, instead of going one way or the other, tries to do a bit of both, and it's a nightmare. Okay, first of all it says if it's a volume contract, then you can have an excuse, exclusive choice of, of court clause. Because again, volume contracts are meant for the big players, so they should be allowed freedom of contract. But it says you've got to choose a court in a contracting state. Why do you think they did that? You want more state to rectify it. Yes, and also if they picked a non-contracting state, that state wouldn't apply the Rotterdam rules. So it would be a very easy way of circumventing the Rotterdam rules. So you've got freedom of contract for your volume contract as long as you stay within the Rotterdam system. Other contracts, in other words, if you're not a volume contract, 
you can only enforce choice of court clauses if they're at the carrier's domicile. What on earth is that about? Most carriers are companies. They don't have a domicile. They have a place of business. So that's a very odd drafting um, technique. Place of receipt or delivery, port of loading or discharge are four familiar places we've seen before. But now the thing that really, I think, causes problems is contracting states can choose whether they opt in under Chapter 14. This was larger to placate the British. The p &I clubs hated this idea. And so they said, well, you'll get a chance to choose. The United Kingdom has already said, if we sign up to the Rotterdam rules, we will not opt into um, the jurisdiction chapter. So you can imagine, half of the countries applying Rotterdam may follow these rules. Others may say, no, we're going to stick with our own system. And I suspect the European Union won't follow these rules. They'll stick with their own conflicts rules. So that's going to be an absolute nightmare. Arbitration. Again, Hague Visby left it up to contracts. Hamburg rules, pretty much the same, says not allowed. You have to hold your arbitration in a particular place, and it gives a list. Rotterdam, again, we see this messy, complicated distinction. Exclusive arbitration clauses will work in volume contracts, but now they say the seat of arbitration has got to be in the carrier's domicile, place of receipt or delivery, ports of loading or discharge. So it's different from exclusive jurisdiction clauses, again, to add another layer of complexity. Um, and then if there are other contracts, then the plaintiff can choose the seat of arbitration. So you can't have, you can't force them into any one of the list above. And as with Chapter 14, contracted states can choose whether to opt in. So that is going to create an utter nightmare. And I just realized I must have fast forwarded over one of the most important slides. So let me go back and see if I can find it. Yes, we never saw that, did we? Okay, that's probably the most important thing, is the carrier's liability. You'll remember, Hague, a good old hundred pounds. Not sure whether it's sterling or gold. It depends on whether you've got the gold clause in there or not. Hague Visby, what Hong Kong is used to, 666.67 SDRs or two SDRs per kg. Hamburg, 835, so it went up a fair bit. 2.5. Rotterdam, they left it in square brackets until a couple of days before the end. It was the last thing to be put in because it was so controversial. Um, there was a lot of discussion as to whether they would stay with Hague Visby. The feeling was that they couldn't sustain that because inflation had basically made that too low a threshold. Or would they go with Hamburg? In the end, they went with Hamburg and added on a bit. So it's now 875 SDRs. I think, what's the current rate as between that and Hong Kong dollars? I'm not too sure. Two SDR. Two. One SDR, 10 RMB. Okay, <laughs> so, so 10, 10 RMB, yeah, okay. And three SDRs per kg, so that's gone up slightly as well. And of course, there's your major difference. Uh, you can now claim for delay, but the maximum is two and a half times the freight you paid. So the carrier can't be liable for pure economic loss above 2.5 times the, the freight payable. Let's just check. 